So I think there are 16 of you, 17 waiting. Uh, sorry if you've been waiting a while. I'm not usually this late. I've been on time a couple of times, so I guess it's just fair that that I'm pretty late for once. So I hope you can forgive me. Um, thanks for voting. I see there are 18 votes. If you haven't voted yet, make sure that you do. Um, just a quick hi to a couple of the members here. Ricardo, Paddy, Robbie Robin, Hey Jealousy, who seems to change his name every couple of days. Nisi, good to see you. Susan B. Um, where is Stephanie? Like Stephanie's become like she was like no matter what, she would always be there. No, no, not sure where she is. Um, anyone that I'm missing? Let's just have a look. Uh, I think that's just about everyone. Uh, by the way, Ricarda, uh, thanks for becoming a member. You're one of our newest members. I think you are the newest member. Uh, True Jedi Forever says, I've missed so many crazy busy few weeks. Glad to be here. So I think this is going to be quite a good um I mean, this is episode 10 and might as well be a good episode, right? Um, can you believe we've, we've gone through 10 episodes of Van Gogh's Letters and we're only in basically early 1878. Um, we've got 12 years still to go through. Not that there's 12 years of letters to go through. I think there's a couple of years where the letters are very few and far between, especially in... I think 1879, 1880, round about there. Um, uh, Susan B says, many thanks for doing the live. I've shortened my name, a.k.a. Susan Becker. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot for that. Uh, I don't know if you guys have, have known, you probably haven't noticed this, but my subscribers' numbers have just dipped under um, 86,500. Um, as you know, I've put up one or two Johnny Depp videos, so that's the result. It's kind of like, oh, True Crime Rocket Science put up a Johnny Depp video, let's unsubscribe. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, I'll be glad when this month is over. Um, I, I've taken, it feels like I've taken a beating um, in not just in this format, not just online, but, but in sort of other ways as well. So I'll be glad when, um, I don't know, it's just we go on to the next month and the next phase of whatever. Now, Patty says, keep them coming. Um, hey, <clears throat> okay, temporary issue, that's good. Okay, do you guys want me to talk to you about the poll? And the poll is, as an adult, where did Vincent van Gogh spend the most time in one place? So that obviously means, um, you know, once he left home, he left home at the age of 16. And then he went to many different places. He was in Amsterdam, he was in London, he was in Ramsgate, <clears throat> he was in Paris, he was in Belgium, uh, he was in All, he was in Auvers, he was in Saint-Rémy. Um, yeah, I am pretty exhausted. Um, I've, I set a goal for myself this month, and I might reach it today, tonight, or tomorrow. If I do, I'm allowed one day off. I mean, if I'd reached the goal earlier, I would have had more days off. But you know, I set a goal, and I might be, um, I, I might allow myself a full day off of YouTube. Um, so it might be tomorrow. Um, we'll see. G True Jedi Forever says, you are quality. Thanks a lot. So um, I'm a, I've already said I'm a little bit disappointed in you guys. Um, uh, I see 26% voted for the coal mines of, Bor of the Borinage. So about a quarter of you think that's where he, where he spent most of his time in one place. Almost half of you thought that he spent most of the time in the asylum. In fact, he was only in the asylum about one year, right? So it probably felt like the longest time, but it definitely wasn't. 
Ole is not a bad candidate, but I, I think he wasn't there more than um, – not really sure exactly how long he was there, but I think it was actually just a kind of a couple of months. Um, let me let me um, be a bit specific about that. He was in all from the twenty first of February eighteen eighty eight to the fifth, the eighth of May eighteen eighty nine. So barely a year. He was barely a year in all. Um, and so, and so, a quarter of you voted for all, and the answer, of course, is Noonan, um, Van Gogh, um, as a older dude, moved back home, and he spent more than two full years in Noonan. So um, that's that's kind of what I wanted to praise this episode with is. He's working very hard as a young man. He's working very hard as a 20-something-year-old to make something of his life. You know, he wants to be a person of significance. Well, not the end of that road, but part of that road will involve him basically going back home and living at home as a sort of failed, angry young man in a way. So the reason I'm telling you this is last week, the last episode I told you, about the mess he made of, of this relationship with Kivos and he upset a lot of people. Um, well, that's one thing that he's heading towards. The other thing is he's going to be going back home. And just in terms, if you think about how it reflects on his adult life, the fact that of all the places he went to, all Paris, the Borinage, London, he spent the most time living with his parents, the most time in one place living with his parents. And what does that show you? That he basically had this failure to launch. Basically, he had these very high hopes. He had these very um, um, sophisticated thoughts and his head was in the clouds and he was very idealistic and very... um, uh, culturally sophisticated, but he, but he ends up not being able to do anything with that or apply it, he, he's kind of a bit of a, a misfit at the end of all of it. And he ends up kind of being a misfit for the rest of his life. So what I want you to, I will forgive you, don't worry. What I, the reason I'm, I'm telling you this at the beginning of the episode is just to remind you that as much as we admire Van Gogh, as much as we think He's got an incredible story. There's also a warning, which is don't, in other words, like keep your feet on the ground. Ask yourself, where am I? What am I doing? Is my um, life going in the right direction? Um, am I am I a um, Am I actually a member of the society? Am, am I part of society or am I a part of society? Um, am I living in a fairy tale or, or am I actually kind of on the right track, right? And so the Van Gogh story is kind of a reminder that it's all fair and well to have these really, um, you know, deep sensitive moments where you pay attention to art and and read books and so on but ultimately what you really need is is knowledge of self-knowledge and knowledge of the world and you only get that by stepping out into the world by stepping out into the unknown you you, you don't get an education of life from a book it may feel like you do but ultimately you only get to know yourself when you're sort of thrown into the maelstrom and that's when you find out what you're really made of and so the, the, the longer you take to, I don't know, prepare for your failure to launch, right, the longer you take to develop this theoretical knowledge, the, the longer you're going to take to not actually live your life and not figure life out kind of thing. Timmy, what are you doing? Uh, not that it's so very true actually says it's not theoretical, yeah. 
And so we come back to what I said in the previous um, uh, episode where I said, you know, Dumbledore warned Harry Potter, he said, it does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. And I feel like we as a society that kind of does that. We, we dwell on fairy tales. We don't know that they're fairy tales, but we dwell on fairy tales and our actual knowledge is somewhat limited, right? Um, <laughs> Robbie Robin says, we get our education from you. Well, I hope you get your education from me and then you go out and smell the flowers and walk your dogs and go for a jog. I, I hope you do that as well. To me, can you calm down? Can you calm down? Okay. So... Um, something else that I want to tell you guys before we jump into the first letter, which is which is dated um, 9th of January, 1878. Um, it's written from Amsterdam. So we're going to get, that's going to be the first letter we deal with. But um, before we get to that, I want to tell you guys a little bit about a conversation I had with my brother. So my brother's uh, an artist. Um I must say, when I walk into his home, it's pretty luxurious. It's leather chairs and painting, oil paintings, and it's pretty nicely put together. And um, anyway, we had this conversation, and we spoke a bit about Van Gogh. And uh, Timmy, can I put you down? <coughs> and um, what was quite funny was... Um, he said he's got this whole library of Van Gogh. And I said, I said, yeah, I've, I've actually got a couple of books myself. So he said, I probably got all of them. So I said, I, I, I think you probably don't have any of them. So he said, no, no, no. I've, I've very likely got all the books that you've got. So I said, shall we test out that theory? So I sort of came back down and I, um, I what do you call it, um, showed him the one book and he said, okay, I don't have that one. Next one, I don't have that one. Next one, I don't have that one. Next one, I don't have that one. So uh, the one that, that Martin Bailey wrote, I have uh, loaned to him and in exchange, um, he's allowed me to go through some of his books. He's actually taken the cover off because he's the one that damaged. But uh, this is the one book and this is the other book. This is the other book, and this is quite an interesting book. Uh, it is Vincent van Gogh, A Life in Letters and Art, right? And so it is actually um, paging through this book. So trying to go through to where we are in terms of our story, and I kind of went to 1878, So this is just to give you an idea of what this this book looks like when you when you open it. You see, it's, it sort of shows letter extracts and pictures. It's really quite special. So this one is extract from Amsterdam, thirty first of May, eighteen seventy seven. But have a look at the artwork that is next to it. Look at that artwork there. It gives you an idea of the kind of setting that you would have experienced in the Netherlands, right? Gray skies, sort of waterlogged fields, uh, churches, trees, and whatnot, right? The other thing that was quite interesting was that my brother told me, he sort of mentioned a quote that really meant a lot to him, kind of verbatim, like out of my heart. And, and the quote went something like this. Um, it's a quote by Vincent van Gogh. I think instead of saying it went something like this, I think I'm going to try and bring it up so I can quote it exactly right. I'm sure I can find it. Um, so this is what he said. So 
So this is what my brother said is a quote from Vincent van Gogh that's always meant a lot to him. He said, and this is from a letter that van Gogh wrote to Theo. He said, well, what shall I say? Our inward thoughts, do they ever show outwardly? There may be a great fire in our soul, but no one ever comes to warm himself at it. And the passers-by see only a little bit of smoke coming through the chimney and pass on their way. So what my brother is talking about is, um, you know, when you see any person, but often especially an artist, you all, all you experience of that person, all you um, perceive, in a sense, is like this wisp of smoke coming out the chimney. What you miss is the fire going on in the belly, in the bowels of this person, like the fire inside the hearth of a house. All you see is this merest little sliver, this 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 um, this thin line of this little bit of smoke coming through the chimney. That's that's how much you know a person when actually there's this fiery. Um, he talks about a great fire in our soul. And I must say, I think the same thing applies to true crime. We come to a case and we think um, that you, we, we almost assume that you instantly know who somebody is. Who's Gabby Petito? Well, it's this young girl who is traveling in a van. That's who Gabby Petito is. No, that's not who Gabby Petito is. Also, Gabby Petito isn't just her name and her age, same as you aren't just your name and your age. Um, you've got to get to know that person, the person that they're with, that's a separate thing to get to know, and then you've got to get to know the dynamic. Those three disciplines take time, and a lot of people just don't have it. People don't have that kind of attention span, don't have that kind of patience, aren't able to do that kind of research, don't have intuition, don't, I don't know, they, they just sort of lack something. Um, not everybody, but it, that is definitely lacking. And I, I think the same, in a way, applies with the Johnny Depp case. People think, well, I've, I've seen that person in a movie. I know exactly who they are. I've seen that person in a magazine article. I know exactly who they are. You only get to know someone by spending a lot of time reading what they say, um, reading what they do, finding out about their family history, spending a lot of time and even then you getting to know in a way just the side that they've revealed. What about the other side? And I just think that this quote is so applicable to the superficial problem that we have in terms of one another. Um, in the same way that you are a deep vessel with strong feelings, passions, frustrations, you've got this whole universe inside you so does somebody else. And so how much time do you take to probe that, to, to think about that, to listen to that, to observe? Um, and how much time does that person take with you, right? So I actually thought that was quite a cool quote from my brother. I'll put a link to that in chat so you can check it out as well. Um, Yvonne says... Like an iceberg, much more under the surface, yeah. Hey, Jealousy says, the illusion of reality. Uh, Robbie Robbins says, that is a great description. Patty says, yay, more material for Van Gogh videos. Hey, Jealousy says, changing names like changing clothes, only the surface of a person. Okay, so um, we're now going to go to 1878. And just to let you know where we are, um, five months from now, Vincent's going to leave Amsterdam and he never again lives in Amsterdam. So when he leaves Amsterdam now, that's it. He's never coming back to Amsterdam. So um, so he will leave Amsterdam on the 13th of, of May and, um, and he, then he heads to Belgium and the coal mines of the Borinage. As I say, we are now going through a phase where um, his writing is going to get quite sparse and time is going to jump in a way. 
So we are now um, in the, la- the, the sort of final phase of um, kind of him being in Amsterdam. And then his life's going to change drastically. And um, basically, how long is it? Uh, around about five years from now, after all that he goes through, after everything that he does from here, he's going to end up kind of returning home with his, his tail between his legs, basically a failure, and now he's going to sort of start his life again. You can imagine his parents sort of disapprove of him. Um, you had so much potential, and he did. Um, you made such a good start, and he did, only to kind of come home and be a great disappointment. And not only as he disappointed in his past life, but when he's actually with his parents, um, they, they're none too chuffed with him. They're not very happy with what he thinks about things. They're not too happy with what he thinks about life. He's kind of got a chip on his shoulder about society. It's almost like he's felt society sucks. And you can kind of make up your mind. Um, probably some of that is true. But I think some of that is also, dude, you were really naive. You, um, you know, does society suck or did you suck in your attempt to understand society and to engage with society or whatever, you know? It's easy to say that in retrospect, but that's part of what you're trying to do is look at where did his life go wrong, why did it go wrong, and all that kind of thing. Once again, what I want you to do when we go through these letters is ask yourself, what is the substance of all of these letters and was this really helping him to, in a, in a practical, constructive way to get his life going or was some of what was the focus of his letters taking him to um, the tail between your legs scenario, right? And it's kind of a lesson to you and me as well as to say, um, maybe you're spending a lot of time on something that's not going to be very good for you, right? He's writing these long letters to his brothers. What if every time he wrote a letter, he instead just did something else, met somebody, um, figured out bricklaying, uh, even started painting then, instead of writing a letter, just already started drawing, right? Um, just think about, it's like, could you just have done something different? What would have happened, right? Um Paddy says, ironically, Van Gogh did triumph in the end, sadly after his death. Um, I think you've got to think about that, that, that issue. Do you, would you like that for yourself? Would you like to like live and die the way Van Gogh died, but you become this incredibly celebrated figure 50 years later? You know, is that the ideal life to have? You know, would you then say that's worth it? In other words, if you did and you say, oh, 50 years later, I became really well known, oh, which is actually all worth it. I'm so glad that I, I suffered. Uh, it's, it's really, you know, it's, I really feel it was worth it now. You think that is how one feels, if it's you. Um, you might think it's funny, but I've written a lot of books and I was always also like, I don't want to be like, I'll write and write and write. And if I'm well known after I die, that's cool. I was like, that's not my idea of, of fulfillment. Um, you know, it's, it's not really real in terms of yourself, right? Um, Nisi says, not worth it to suffer. I'm not, I'm not saying you should try and avoid suffering at, all, suffering at all costs, and I'm not saying you should try and avoid pain at all costs, and you should try and, try and avoid effort at all costs, just that there's got to be a balance between... Um, the work that is that is life, the work and the effort and the pain of paying attention and the pain of giving certain things up. But then there must also be the joy and the celebration of achieving certain things, getting somewhere, having experiences of life and all that kind of thing. It shouldn't just be pain and suffering. By the same time, it couldn't just be joy and celebration either. And, and, and it's only up to you to find out what that balance is. Uh, actually says, that's why I like to write a time machine, one never dies. 
Ivan says, don't laugh, but do you think he could have been on the spectrum in some way and that's why it couldn't launch? To me, questions like that um, are like self-defeating. It's almost like you say, no matter what he said or did, it doesn't really matter. He was on the spectrum, so that's that's the end of the story. In other words, you say, um, reg- like, just take everything we know and throw it in the trash. He was on the spectrum, so no matter what he did, that, that would have been it. What I'm trying to say is that... He was quite a functional dude. He was. He had a job at the age of sixteen. His letters are are lucid and sensible. He is quite educated in lots of different matters. He is very um, uh, focused and effective in accumulating certain information. Um, the the issue is how does he apply it, and is his focus um, ultimately too theoretical. Also, does he spend too much time in a sort of academic role and as a result of that he becomes detached from society? I, d- I really don't think that is like that person's got a disorder. I think you could take any person and say study the Bible all day, all week for weeks and months and study art all day and talk about art and describe a sunset every single day, right? And you will eventually become detached from other people because you're just spending so much time stepping outside of life in order to record it that you're not actually in, in the experience itself. Uh, Yvonne says, no, but for him it was difficult to rebound for some reason too much study. I think it's not just, it's too much study, but it's also what is his guiding psychology. So if his guiding psychology is being poor and not having money and being miserable is commendable, then that's then that's going to have a big impact on, on his journey through life. Uh, if his governing psychology is that... Um, yeah, I mean, what he, I think let's ask the question like this. What is his governing psych- psychology in terms of the opposite sex in his case? What is his governing psychology in terms of his own identity? I am now a failure. What should I do with my life? That then becomes a self-limiting factor in a, in a, in a way. Anyway. Yeah, I do mean that he didn't engage in reality enough as a young person. I think he did engage in reality quite a lot as a 30-something, um, but it was kind of too late. He was almost there, but it was kind of too late. Uh, actually, says, well, writers die but continue living and can learn from writers who have long gone. Um well, if you think the it's really commendable to, to write books and and then someone else comes along and they read your book and they have this great life thanks to you, then then that's your version of success. It's not my version of success. I think part of part of what it, what makes a great writer is someone who's lived a great life. They've they've Um, they've had a successful life in a certain sense. And so if you're reading about them or you're reading their thoughts, well, if they've had a successful life, well, then those are thoughts probably worth reading. Whereas the opposite is also true. If someone's been a great writer, and there are quite a few people like that, Enid Blyton for children, Ayn Rand for adults, but there are quite a few that one can mention, Gerald Durrell, um, they were pretty successful writers, but they were pretty kind of unsuccessful as people. They were quite dysfunctional. They were quite unhappy. Um, there were other things going on. And I don't know whether you want art to, to come at the cost of life and happiness and joy. And to some extent, that's the story of Van Gogh. 
if you if you say that's commendable and and I want to be that person, I want to have a miserable life, and someone's going to think my writing's awesome, then that's what you think. I don't think that. I think um, in order to be a true artist worth um, admiring, I think you need to create great art, but also live um, a life that's that was worth living. Um, I don't think your exit from the world should be, oh, oh no, the sadness is going to last forever. You know what I mean? Um, uh, Terry says, Terry, good to see you. Uh, harder to connect with more like-minded people back then. Uh Hey, jealousy, it's a good point. Failure is always a part of real life. But can you learn from your failures? Was Van Gogh learning or was he insisting that the Paul Pilgrim's way was the way to go? So let's get going with this letter. Um, Dear Theo, 9th January 1878. I'm so anxious to know if you're feeling better that I'm writing at once to beg you to send at least a postcard to let me know whether you are all right again. I arrived here safe and sound on Monday night. Tuesday morning, I began my lessons again. I intend to do the exercises I've already done all over again, at least as much as I have time for in addition to my other work. Father advised this for once one is well grounded in grammar and the verbs translations become easier. I shall find time for it as soon as the sun rises earlier and it is less cold so that I can begin early. If one works from early morning until late at night, one can accomplish a great deal in a few months. And so I hope to be ready for the examination by October. Now, if you just think about this in a, in a way, he's working really, really hard, he's getting up early in the morning, he's working late at night. And if, if he could send himself a postcard through time and say, guess what? All of the, this effort is ultimately going to come to naught. You're not even going to become a preacher. You kind of get a sense of did he waste time or was the meandering through this particular chapter of his life taking him where he needed to go? I think you can argue it both ways. You can say this is part of what made him the person he ultimately became, so it was necessary. Uh, I don't know whether he would see it the same way. He might say, um, all those days wasted. So I can tell you in 1990, I served a year in the Air Force. And then two or three years later, what was then compulsory military service was then um, discontinued. So I served a year in the military, two or three years, two or three years later, they were like, okay, for everybody, compulsory military service is no more. And then you say, did I waste, did I just waste a year of my life? And of course, you don't want to think that. It's very painful to think that, but essentially you did. Because the guy who didn't do that got a year, year sort of head start on you kind of thing. So anyway, it goes on to say, I saw a great many fine drawings at Uncle Chorus, also a new and very clever one by Rochusen. Now, if, again, if you look at his letters almost as a divine interlocutor, as a sort of um, omniscient, godlike figure, and you say, and you could you can sort of move forward and backwards in time, and you sort of can, you can go forward and backwards through the timeline of his letters and his life, you could say, his interest in art in his letters, as expressed in his letters, is going to help him because he's going to become an artist one day. So in other words, his interest in art um, is definitely kind of materially going to of be of some use to him. I think the flip side of that is um, certain other interests are, aren't necessarily going to, and that's true of all of us. Sometimes you go down a, a road that you end up coming straight back from, you know, okay, so I, I shouldn't have done that. I don't want to create this impression that you should never take risks and never make mistakes. 
In fact, I would say the opposite. You should take a lot of risks, take a lot of, make a lot of mistakes, because the more mistakes you make, the 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 more um, what's the word? The more the less the fear is of making those mistakes. Plus, the quicker you learn not to make mistakes. So the fewer mistakes you make, the more you fear making mistakes, and I guess the less you learn from each mistake. The more you make mistakes, the more you're willing to make mistakes, but also the more you learn from them. Um, so I just want to read this. Susan Skrisky, thanks for that. Growing up in a fundamentalist re religious home, such as Vincent's, could have been enough to do a number on his outlook, scarcity mentality as well. Thanks a lot, hey, jealousy. Thanks. So that's quite a good point. I don't know if I see it as fundamentalist, but I do think it was quite... Um, I, I see it in two ways. The one is that it can create a cocoon that is both something that within that cocoon... Um, there's love and support and you can come out as a beautiful butterfly and you can fly around in the, the greater cocoon of that, that um, sort of institutionalized uh, scenario, right? Um, the other side of that is if you are inside the cocoon and you say, okay, and you, you're living your whole life inside this cocoon, and then you kind of go, this isn't working for me. Um, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is what he said when the thing with Key Voss didn't work out. Then you break out of the cocoon. You've got no experience living outside of the cocoon. You've got no friends there. You've got no support system, right? So um, you see what I'm saying? By the way, someone's just said hi. So let me say hi. Robbie Robbins says, do you think Vincent's mother was affectionate? Um, it's difficult to say. Yeah, it's difficult to say. Um, I think they were quite a close family, uh, given his relationship with his brother, the fact that he would go home for Christmas. I think it was quite a close family. Um It's hard to say whether his parents should have been less patient with him or more patient. I'm almost inclined to say less patient, to say, um, we're not going to support you in this. Uh, you are not, you know what I mean? You, this is not working out. Um, you, you never are going to be a pastor. You, you, you're not cut out for this kind of thing. So I don't know. Um, but that is an interesting point from Susan. So thanks for that. Uh, Axie says he got trapped by trying to be what he thought he should be. Nisi says, where do you draw the line between support and enabling? Well, I think if you're a parent, your, your line that you draw is you say, my job is to make this person independent. My job is to help this person launch, right? And so um, I think you've got to think about it, the enabling part in a positive way. I mean, you can enable someone where they are enabled into bad habits and, and laziness and and not doing things. I think the enabling should be where you enable them to uh, step out into the world, you encourage them to take risks, you encourage um, courage, you encourage um learning the ropes in terms of lots of different situations, work-wise, social-wise, travel-wise, um, if that makes sense, that you are not like just within the bosom, the, the, the safe, comfortable bosom of family or your neighborhood or whatever, but you can also operate and exist beyond that. You can create your own networks, not just rely on ones that – your family have said put in place. If you think about a lot of Van Gogh's early relationships are just with family members. You've got a great relationship with his brother, but where are his friends? Like, what's going on? Um, 
where are his girlfriends? You know, what's going on there? The other thing that you'll notice is he goes from being this very pious dude to frequenting brothels quite a lot. So, again, it's it's quite a wild pendulum swing. I, I would really love to know at what point he visits a brothel for the first time. Is it in the middle of his studies to become a pastor? Or is it immediately after he abandons his studies? Is it like, okay... I'm going over to the dark side, where do I dive in, kind of thing. Yvonne Phillips says, also Vincent was still quite young at this time that we are discussing, and even at that time, even at the time of his death, had he been able to live a full life, he may well have worked through it all. Um, not sure, I'm not sure about that. I think if he'd started selling his art, that would have been a route to success. Uh, otherwise, other than that, I don't quite see that happening. If Van Gogh had survived his brother, but his brother had died, uh, I'm not quite sure how things would have gone for him. Um, but as I say, I think if his art started selling, then his life would have gone on into a certain tra trajectory. I don't know how well Van Gogh would have done without his brother. Robbie says, my daughter succeeded in her first uni year, good for you, but has needed lots of extra support. Her journey to independence will be slower than average. Well, everyone's got their own life. And you know what they say, the, a guaranteed way of being unhappy is to compare yourself unfavorably to other people. If you want to absolutely guarantee that you're going to be miserable, just constantly compare yourself unfavorably to someone else because there always is someone. Okay, let's go back to this letter. So he's talking about art. He says, um, I will hang those prints you gave me um, in my room. This is to Theo. He says, I'm sorry that I did not take a later train from The Hague. We could have been together a little longer, but now I hope to see you again in the spring when you go on your business trip. It is very cold here these days, and this morning everything was covered with snow. I'm glad Uncle Vincent has gone abroad. He will be in Paris tonight. When you see Mauve, remember to ask him for that poem by Jules Breton, Le Laboureur, and send it to me when you get it. Now, if you just think about Vincent van Gogh in his everyday life, uh, when he goes home, when he goes to see his brother, he catches a train. Does he ever talk to other passengers on the train? Do, do they ever talk to him? Um, or is there this polite reserve and you sort of go through life not talking to anyone, um, just sticking to the script and um, and then you kind of end up in this void where it's like, well, this didn't work out. Um, I remember when I lived in England um, talking on the train and it would be like a, a full carriage sometimes if you were commuting into London. I'll never forget it. It was like every single passenger had like a newspaper up, every single one, Right. And uh, you were inclined to do the same thing. Okay, well, okay, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And um, But quite a few times I would speak to someone next to me and I would be the only one talking in that carriage and you'd kind of get a few glances like, this is totally inappropriate. Um, we do not talk to one another. We are going to work. We work, when you get back, we pick up the paper and then we go back. I just remember that and that's quite weird. We noticed in South Korea, one, I think it was a Saturday, it may have been a Sunday. This is a little bit different though, but it just shows also the cultural um, configuration. Um, I think we, we were a couple of friends going to a bicycle shop in Seoul and um, I was with, I think, two guys from New Zealand, and it was, I think, it could have been fairly early in the morning on a Sunday, maybe on a Saturday, and we were just sitting on opposite sides of the train. The train was quite empty. It was quite early in the day, and just chatting, just talking about whatever we were talking about, and at a certain point, this elderly Korean guy came up to me and hit my legs like really, really hard. I think he even kicked them. 
and um, I couldn't understand what you're saying because you're speaking in Korean. But but the impression I got was you you are um, and I, I seem to even think that he, he called the police. He was so upset, but it seemed to be something like I was sit I was sort of slouch sitting. So you know I'm like this um, almost like a the a delinquent youth kind of thing and also and I think what he said to the policeman or something like his talking is irritating me <laughs> so those who see my talking as ASMR well this guy was being highly highly irritated it was like because he can't understand English he's just hearing blah 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 and he got so angry he actually kicked my legs like it was the probably the worst thing I experienced in South Korea. And it's just a cultural thing. When you're on a train, you don't talk. When you're on a train, you sit up straight. And there, it's a patriarchal society, so you see someone who's slouching, jabbering, and it's like, well, I'm a senior figure. I have every right to go up to this person, even though it's a foreigner. Kick him and tell him to shut up because you, your, your accent or your... The fact that I don't know what you're saying is irritating me. And I, I kind of, after it happened, I thought, can you imagine being in any other country in the world and you can't understand what someone's saying and you you hit them and you say, be quiet, you're, what you're saying is irritating me. Can you imagine that? Um, so, yeah, that's just pretty, that was definitely pretty shocking. I think that's something that's almost on a par with this was, on one of my first days in South Korea, I was being chaperoned through this one particular um, district, quite a upmarket district. I think it was called Upkujong, and and so this fellow teacher, Korean teacher, was sort of um, you know I was getting to know the city, and and I think we went into a shoe shop. I don't think we went into a shoe shop because I wanted to go into a shoe shop. I think she. She needed something there. She she she'd gotten her sh shoes repaired or something like that, right? She got her shoes repaired, and so she was going back there to get her repaired shoes. But this is what I remember: the door opens. I think she yeah, I think she opened the door, stepped in, and I sort of stepped in after her. And the next thing. Like I sort of stepped in, and, and the, at the opposite corner of the room was uh, the the shopkeeper, the shoe shop dude by behind the counter, and almost the moment I saw him, almost the moment I made eye contact with him, I heard the shout, and the next thing, a shoe flew my way, <laughs> and and it was like. I don't know, it was bizarre, but I saw the shoe and the shoe was almost like in slow motion hurtling towards me and it, there wasn't any panic. It was just like, and the, flew, and the shoe sort of flew past me. And then I think he, sh he threw another shoe and that was, I don't think, anywhere near me. And I was like, um, should I not be in the shop? Like, is it, is it you know... Um, um, I don't know, is it something like that? Should, you know, should I leave the this, this store? And then I slowly clicked that I think some customer had brought uh, something. I don't know whether he brought shoes back or what, but, but what had actually happened was the moment I, I stepped inside the, the, the store, um, the shopkeeper had thrown the shoes of a customer and obviously almost hit me and I kind of just immediately assumed it was directed at me and, and it actually had nothing to do with me. And I was still like, I said to this lady teacher, um, do, do they not like Westerners here or something? And she said, no, 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 that had nothing to do with you. That was, you know, um, the customer and the cashier were arguing or something like that. But, um, I mean, in that moment, it was like, the boots like flying towards me and I'm like, okay, that missed me, but what the, what the heck is going on here, right? And um, that's also something I don't know if I've experienced really anywhere else. Um, you know, I just can't really think of anything like that. 
But I don't want to misrepresent the Koreans. I found them very kind, um, very, uh, um, I had a great time when I was there. Not all of it was wine and roses, but it was definitely a really um, interesting experience. And I don't know whether Vincent really had that. Like um, when I went overseas, I went to different countries. I got into some situations like I've just described um, and others. And uh, but I, but I was I, I like didn't have my nose in a book the whole time and I and I although I, I'm someone who often does, um, you kind of get the feeling that even when he was somewhere else, he wasn't really in the world, um, and he probably needed to have done that a bit more. Um, I kind of get the feeling that him falling in love with that British girl not working out was like an early, what can you call it, an early um, setback that he really took hard and that then he withdrew into his shell in a way. Um, you know, he didn't learn, you know, try, try again kind of thing. Anyway, so he talks here about um, Uncle Cor asked me today if I didn't like Pirne by Jerome. I told him that I would rather see a homely woman by Israels or Millet or an old woman by Eduard Freire. For what's the use of a beautiful body such as ferns or ferns? Animals have it too, perhaps even more than men, but the soul as it lives in the people painted by Israels or Millet or Freire, that is what animals never have, is not life given us to become richer in spirit, even though the outward appearance may suffer. I feel very little sympathy for the figure by Jerome. I can find no sign of spirituality in it, and a pair of hands which show that they've worked are more beautiful than those of this figure. The difference is greatest still between such a beautiful girl and a man like Parker. Or So he may be making an interesting argument, he may be making a convincing argument, but it's a theoretical argument. Um, it reminds me of... Um, I don't know whether you guys can sort of um, see where I'm coming from. You know, like uh, I've been in a situation a couple of times where you're watching like a beauty pageant. It might be for us like Miss South Africa or Miss World. And you're kind of saying, now nah, she, she, she's really not pretty. And it's like, well, if you met one another face to face, would you actually have a chance, like, would she look at you and go, something could happen here? Meanwhile, you're kind of making these statements, and she's not really pretty, she's quite nice, you know what I mean? But it's totally theoretical. Put yourself actually in that situation. Funny enough, I did actually once, I was once official photographer for, um, for Miss World, and um, that was definitely an interesting experience. Because some of the women, they look like like aliens. They're so tall. They're so beautiful. It's like, what planet do you come from kind of thing? Um, I'm just saying it's that same kind of theoretical thing where you're sitting in your lounge and you're kind of going, I don't know whether any of you guys watch The Bachelor or something, and you kind of go, he's ugly or um, whatever. And then, But in the real situation, um, you know, how – where would you fit in terms of that old equation? And this reminds me of what he's saying here. It's the same thing. Um, blah, 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 blah. And, well, Vincent, do you have a girlfriend? Vincent, are you really a handsome stud muffin kind of thing? Do you get what I'm saying? And I do want to take the conversation to where you say, ultimately, this guy is going to end up as a bit of a failure in terms of certainly this area of his life. Why is that happening? I do want to be a bit critical of that. I don't want to just be gushing, saying, wow, he's so clever and he's so brilliant and he's so dedicated. There's the other side that's that's not so great, which is that he's headed for disaster. And so how can we learn from that not to do that? Then he also writes, Uncle Cor then asked me if I should feel no attraction for a beautiful woman or girl. So this is what's happening in a letter in Amsterdam Corey, his uncle is literally saying to him, don't you feel any attraction for like a beautiful woman? And at this point, he's 24 years old. And uh, he says, 
I answered that I would feel more attraction for and would rather come into contact with one who was ugly or old or poor or in somewhere unhappy, but who through experience and sorrow had gained a mind and a soul. Now, on the one hand, that's really incredibly profound. <laughs> on the other hand, his love life is actually headed for disaster. And he's, he's about to have a relationship, not like right now, but, but he's about to have a relationship with someone who is all those things, ugly, old, poor, in some way unhappy, and who would ultimately commit suicide. Um, we'll deal with that experience in due course. So in a way, you can see he's kind of in love with, he's kind of infatuated with this idea of de not depravity, but deprivation is in love with this idea of um, struggle and, and I guess strife, right? And I get what he's saying. He's saying that through experience and sorrow, you gain a mind and a soul. The thing is, he's actually not getting any experience, right? Do you see what I'm saying? He knows the theory about how to live and how to gain knowledge but he, he's not really practicing it himself. Let me read that again. So his, his uncle says, don't you feel any attraction for a beautiful woman or girl? And he says, you know what I would feel more attraction for? Uh, and I, you know, I'd rather come into contact with someone who's ugly or old or poor or in some way unhappy and through experience and sorrow has gained a mind and a soul. What I don't think he maybe appreciates is that um, – it's a little bit like saying, um, you know, I'd rather be with a poor person. They know what life's all about. Whereas I would say a, a rich person or someone who's successful may actually have figured out what life's all about better than the one who's poor or someone who's lost a fortune, meaning you've figured out your place in the world and you figured out kind of how the world works isn't that better than someone who kind of hasn't um, and may have some kind of psychology that they're misapplying, right? Um, anyway, he says, there was also a beautiful drawing by Marius at Uncle Cora's, a view of the city with water in the foreground. What is quite interesting in this letter is that he's acknowledging this kind of, I don't want to say aversion, but, but this already there's a kind of, um, standoffishness in, in his case to the opposite sex. Do you see that? There's already this kind of thing of if I see a beautiful girl, I'm not interested. I'm actually interested in anyone else, uh, someone who's ugly or poor or old or unhappy. And you've got to like say, Jeepers, what, what has happened to you? Um, anyway, so that's his thing. So he says, he signs that off, um, your loving brother, Vincent. And now we go to the next letter. It's about a, a month later, 10th of February, 1878. Dear Theo, it is Sunday night and I'm going to write to you again for I would like to get another letter from you. Write again soon. My thoughts are so often with you. I certainly hope you had a pleasant Sunday. As you know, Father has come to see me. That gave me a great pleasure. Together we went to see Mendes to Uncle Strickers. Now bear in mind, Uncle Strickers is the father of Key Voss, uh, to Uncle Kors and at the two Mays families. The most agreeable part to remember of father's visit is the morning we spent together in my bedroom, correcting some of my work and a heap of other things. You can imagine how the days flew by. After having taken father to the station, after having watched the train until it disappeared and the smoke was no longer visible, I returned home. Father's chair was still near the table with the books and copy books we had examined that day. And though I know that we shall see each other again pretty soon, I cried like a child. Isn't that profound? Um, he's 24 years old. He's kind of had this kind of temporary... Um, closeness with his father, you know, where he says um, his father and him spent a lot of time together in his bedroom uh, correcting uh, work and 
and, and apparently this went over the course of quite a few days. And then after his father had left, he returned home, and although he knew he would see his father again, when he just looked at that chair, he said he cried like a child. And I don't know, there's something so profound about that um, which, which shows that something is missing in this young man's life, um, that he's working very hard, he's struggling, but something is definitely missing. Um, thanks, Paddy. I think that is it, is, it is definitely quite heartbreaking. And so in this moment, you know, he's got all this strength, he's got all this courage, he's got all this determination, um, he's, he's able to plow through all of this work and effort and frustration. And, um, and at this point, he's, he's just cries like a child. He's 24 years old. And if you think about it, nothing's really happened. There's no drama. There's no sort of injury. Um, he simply spent quite a long time with his father, and, and now his father's left, and now he must go back to what he was doing kind of alone, right? And that is a really authentic moment right there. And that was also a moment for him to say, what are you doing with your life? Who are you? Um, is, does, does what I'm doing serve me? Must I continue down this path? That moment where he cries and he breaks down is a moment that he could have taken a different route, right? He's realizing, I think, the sacrifice that he's making. He's realizing the toll that it's taking. He's also realizing how much he needs his father's validation, his support, his help. Is, is encouragement, but just not, not necessarily from letters and from afar, but hands-on right there. I think he's feeling the this, 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 this sense of being absolutely isolated and alone in his journey towards whatever he's, he's trying to achieve. He's feeling that void, um, which he's going to feel again with uh, Kivas. This is a kind of a prelude to that. Um, then he says, this morning I was in the English church and I met Weirda as I was leaving. We walked part of the way together and he asked me if I would come to see his room. He lives on the Weirdingstraat. I went home with him and stayed for lunch until about three o'clock and saw his books and heard various things about his life. Then home again and translated a page or so from Caesar. This afternoon I was at Uncle Stricker's. I go there rather often now that Uncle Jan is out of town and the house is lonely again with Father gone. So guess what happens when he heads to Uncle Stricker? He sees key parts, but he doesn't mention that in the letter. Um, he says, it is foggy here today. Luckily the weather was fine during Father's visit so that we could take many walks. Probably Uncle Jan will come back on Tuesday. Again, he's spending time with men. He's spending time with uncles and grown men. He's not really spending time with guys his age. Um, he's kind of, it seems like he's kind of homeschooling himself, if that makes sense. Not entirely, but somewhat. Um, then he says, uh, May, good to see you here. Uh, then he says, I suppose you are very busy at the beginning of the year, like most people. Things are becoming more and more serious for me as the examination draws nearer. I shall be glad when it gets light earlier in the morning. Has Father thought of giving you the photograph of that picture by Maris, the wood engraving after Van Goyen, Dordrecht, is hanging in its place? The other day I went to see the picture again at the museum. It is very, very fine. That also makes you kind of wonder when Van Gogh sort of is this lonely figure sort of huddled up against the cold and he, and he walks into a museum and he sort of looks up and he's sort of wide-eyed looking at his artworks. And he's not just looking at them blankly. He's not like this sort of zombie, sort of um, almost like sleepwalking through a museum. He's looking at this art with... Um, wisdom beyond his years and insight beyond his years. You know, he's a ex-art dealer. Does he not encounter people there? Does he not encounter strangers in the museum and say to them, um, by the way, this is that, and oh, I heard you talking about that. Does he not engage ever at all? And as a result, his, his loneliness and isolation continues. But every time 
Isn't that a choice not to engage? Anyway, he goes on to say, uh, when you come back here, I should like to look through the etchings by Dürer at the museum with you, the way we did Rembrandt's last time. Scheveningen must be beautiful these great days. Do you go there often? Now, what's quite interesting in this book that from my brother, um, the, the couple of really um, nice pictures that he he did on Scheveningen. I, I don't know if I can find them very quickly, but when I did go through this, um, I did notice those pictures. I don't know whether I can quickly find them. Um, so this is a page from dealing with Brussels. I don't think this artwork actually comes from that particular time, but that's where they've got it. Um, There's another really beautiful letter that he wrote, that he wrote. Can you see that letter over there? Look at the sketch that's there. Have you seen this Van Gogh portrait before? Look at that. I don't know if it's maybe it's not in this book. Uh, or maybe it is. Um, these are boots that he previously painted. And if you watch At Eternity's Gate, you know that's the scene that the the movie opens off with or opens up with where he's in all the, the shutters are battering, the mist are sort of blowing the shutters. And then um, he sort of like, well, I can't go anywhere. So he takes off his boots, throws them on the ground and paints them. This is the kind of, again, the kind of gloomy but pastoral setting that he would see when he was in the Netherlands. Right? Okay, so this is Noonan. Yeah, no, I can't. I can't seem to find. Maybe it's in the other book. So this particular picture isn't from Van Gogh, but it's it's nevertheless in the in the Netherlands and shows you how beautiful it can be. Um, that is by Claude Monet. Isn't that a kind of a beautiful scene? That's how beautiful the Netherlands can be when it's sort of at full flourish. I just want to see if I can find the the dunes that he painted of Scheveningen. I, I just don't see it here. I don't know if it's not in this book. Maybe it's in this book. I think it is in this book. I think it is in this book, yeah. So I'm just going to show you a couple of pages here. So this particular painting is Beach at Scheveningen in Stormy Weather. Just painted in 1882, which is about four years from now, this particular picture. And if you know your Van Gogh um, history, this particular painting was later stolen from the museum and sort of went on the run along with another picture and, um, and then was later retrieved. And so the value of that painting went up by whatever, 25%, which is a lot. Um, this picture here next to it is actually called 
dunes and it's taken at the Hague, which is also right next to Shevening, and it's this one at the bottom. But you can kind of see that for the most part, the art here is very drab. It's sort of uh, tones of dark brown, tones of gray. Um, it's kind of very drab. Can you see how drab it all is? There's not really much color. There's like no yellow whatsoever. And this is kind of who Vincent was in 1886. Have you seen this portrait before? So quite a thoughtful fellow, right? Yeah, very earthy, definitely very earthy. Um, he has another landscape with dunes, farmhouses, potato digging. But you can see it's all quite somber, all pretty somber. And he sees this as, as really uh, profound. He sees in the, in the sort of somberness and suffering, he sees the human condition, but in a way that's um, quite meaningful. Anyway, just bear in mind that he's still quite a long way from this point. He's not painting yet, but that is where he's going to be going. He's going to be painting these depressing scenes. He's going to be painting these scenes that seem to be sunken in murk and gloom, right? And somehow he's going to come out of that. So he's going to go into this painting phase, but, but in a, like, shrouded in um, kind of misery, and then somehow is the, the, the light is going to come out. And, and I think that is part of the triumphant journey um, of his mind, was that, that despite all the darkness, despite all the, um, all the dead ends, despite all the frustration, he found his way to the color and the vitality and the brilliance and vibrance of the world. And that's really the transcendent power of Van Gogh's mind and vision that, that inspires us all today. That, that throbbing sky outside the asylum, you know, can, did you actually know that he painted Starry Night from the asylum? I mean, of all the places to see a vision like that, um, he did it in this, this place of absolute... Um, you know, like a dere he, he, who he was then, he was like a derelict shipwreck, and yet outside his window he saw this magical, um, uh, fiery world, right? Now you look out at the night sky, and if you see any stars, um, it just seems pretty static. He sees this fluid, electrical, uh, blazing fireworks, and he's like, the world is alive, you know? And he wants to be alive as well in it. Uh, anyway, so let's come back to reality. He says, Sheveningen must be beautiful these gray days. Do you go there often? It's a, really a place with fond memories for him. Um, he says, how is Mauve? Hope he's well. Have you seen him lately? He says, I have lessons from Uncle Stricker twice a week now. I profit a great deal from it as Uncle is very clever and I'm glad he has found time for it. Um, and then that's that letter. Um, the next one is um, 18th of February. If you want to read along with me, I'll put a link in there. Um, actually says he was emerging from the cave. Yeah, well said. Not there yet. The fact that he still had the desire to paint at that point is curious. I think he just had this deep, deep need to express himself. Like there's so much frustration, there's so much toil, there's so much trouble, there's so much thinking that he's just like, I need this to come out. I need to show you what I'm thinking. I need, you know, it's like, it's like the, the fire and the little chimney smoke coming out. You, need, you guys need to see this fire. 
And, um, you know, he did in the end communicate that. So just to come back to the 46 votes, if you haven't voted yet, make sure you do. As an adult, where did Vincent van Gogh spend the most time in one place? Most of you said all, uh, then um, the asylum, then the coal mines of the Borinage. The answer is actually the one you guys voted for the least, Noonan, which is, was actually with his parents. He spent the most time as an adult actually living with his parents. Okay, so let's go on to this next letter. From Vincent to Theo, Amsterdam, 18 February, 1878. Bear in mind... We're counting down to his last letters from Amsterdam and he will never, he'll never be here again. Dear Theo, thanks for your letter of February 17 made me very happy as I'd been looking forward to it so much. And I'm answering it at once, boy, for I think of you and long for you so often. And every morning the prints on the wall of my little study remind me of you. So the pot was calling the kettle black when you wrote me that I ought not to send you a print for your room sometimes when I find one that I think you will like. In my turn, I say enough of that. But tell me if you have got some new acquisitions for your collection lately. Then he goes through, um, I think, an art magazine and he talks about engravings by Millet including Falling Leaves, The Raven's Wedding, Donkeys in a Marsh, The Woodcutters, Housewife Sweeping a Room, A Farm Courtyard, The Dune, and St. John's Eve. Last Sunday, Uncle Jan and I spent the whole afternoon and evening at Uncle Cor's. It was a very pleasant day for me. I got up very early and went to the French church in the morning. A clergyman from the neighborhood of Lyons preached here. He had come to collect money for an evangelical mission. His sermon was mainly stories from the, the lives of the working people in the factories. And though he was not particularly eloquent and one could even hear that he spoke with some difficulty and effort, his words were still effective because they came from the heart. Only such are powerful enough to touch other hearts. So you can see he's quite a sincere guy. You know, he's saying this guy actually didn't communicate very well, didn't speak very well, but his words were actually effective even so because they came from the heart, and that's what he wants to do. He's like, I'm not perfect, but I'm going to speak from the heart. He's sort of kind of saying, I'm going to be an authentic voice, and that's enough, right? At one o'clock, I had to be at the Sunday school of an English clergyman, Adler, in the Barnes, uh, Barnesteg. He has a small but very neat old church there. However, the school was held in a little room, where even at that hour in the middle of the day, the gas light had to be turned on. So it's pretty cold. There were perhaps 20 children from that poor section. Though he is a foreigner, he preaches in Dutch, but the service is in English. He teaches his Bible class in Dutch too and does it very well. I had brought with me a sketch of the map of the Holy Land, which I made for Father's birthday, in red crayon and on strong brown paper, and I gave it to him. So yeah, he is... Uh, acknowledging that he's already doing a little bit of sketching, right? It's not like when he decides to become an artist, he just starts drawing or painting. He's already done a little bit of sketching here and there. It's not like brand new to him. Um, how long is this letter? Um... He talks about, it is certainly very doubtful that I shall ever succeed. And he says, I mean, shall I ever pass all the examinations? So he's kind of just sharing this sense of the towering burden of studying to become a pastor. And this is also a really authentic moment. He's kind of saying, I don't know if I can do it. And that fear turns out to be totally rational because he's, he's going to fail. He's going to fail at becoming a pastor. And yeah, he expresses doubt to his brother. He says, I don't know if I'll ever pass all the examinations. He says, five years at the least is a very long time. 
if one begins earlier, it is so much easier. It is true I can work longer and concentrate better and things that many others care about have no attraction for me. But after all, the work costs me great effort. Even if I fail, I want to leave my mark here and there behind me. So you see, is even is aware of the possibility of failure. Do you see that? Do you see that it's not like completely out of his thought process. He's kind of aware, I might be being quite naive here. I might, this might not work, but I'm going to keep at it. And then he says, even if I fail, I want to leave my mark. And that's certainly something that he ends up doing. He says, there are so many, many things one has to know. And though they try to reassure me, it constantly gives me a terribly anxious feeling. So this is really um, also him being very transparent. He's saying, I'm really struggling with anxiety. I don't know if I can do this. I'm worried I'm going to fail. And as I say, he's going to fail. Um, and that anxiety is actually um, something he needs to listen to. He's anxious because what he's up against is, is a very real um, challenge, right? And sometimes the, the best way to deal with anxiety isn't that you just overcome it and you say, I'm not going to be worried. Sometimes it is to acknowledge it and say, the anxiety is real because this actually isn't right for you. Otherwise, right? Anyway, he says, there's no remedy but to set to work again, since it is clearly my duty to do this, and duties are italicized. He's kind of just saying, I just have to do this. I don't have a choice. And he says, it doesn't matter what it costs, I must push on, for standing still or going back is out of the question. It would make things even more difficult and cause confusion, and the end would mean the necessity of beginning all over again. Now, at the same time that we address this, I think we've also got to address the suicide narrative at the end of his life. So here, he's terribly anxious, he's struggling, he's, he's got this fear of failure. And at the end of his life, people will say, well, he wasn't selling his art, his brother was having difficulty at work, so he committed suicide. He'd been there before, he'd been in this place of like, a dog dead end and and it's difficult to extricate himself from this um, sort of labyrinth of 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 trouble and um, everything that he's got to do to I guess prove himself. So he'd been here before and he he pushed on and he was a guy of quite great. Endurance, you know, he, he could lose his ear, go to an asylum, and come out the other side. Um, he could go to these coal mines and be in these really horrible conditions and come out the other side. So, what I don't think people realize because they just don't know Van Gogh is is an incredibly resilient dude. Um, he likes the idea actually of suffering. He thinks suffering refines the soul. Um, suffering is good for the heart. Um, on the other side of suffering is um, joy, rejoicing and celebration. That suffering is part of the plight of man. He's not trying to avoid it. And when he's in it himself, it's not like I can't handle it. He seems to handle it pretty well. That's the one thing that he does learn to do is deal with going without, with suffering. Anyway, so he says, I must push on for standing still or going back is out the question. It would make things even more difficult and cause confusion. And the end would mean the necessity of beginning all over again. I had a nice letter from home. The journey seems not to have done father any harm. It's pretty late and I'm not a little tired for I've walked a, a distance today. Have a good time and blessings on your work and all you undertake. Good night and sleep well. Believe me, your loving brother, Vincent. Okay, let me just have a sip here. Right, we're on to 3rd of March, 1878. We're marching on through 1878. And bear in mind, we're two months away from um, 
him leaving Amsterdam. Uh, Axie says, I think he's amazingly brave here. Yvonne says he was successful at trying. That's true. He did try. He tried really, really hard. He tried really hard at a lot of things, actually. Um, 3rd of March, 1878, Vincent to Theo. My dear Theo, it is time to write to you again how I should have liked to be with you today. It is such lovely weather here, and one is the feeling that spring is on its way. The lark can probably already be heard in the country, but that's unlikely to happen in the city, unless one can detect its call in the voice of some old clergyman whose words come from a heart that's in tune with the larks. Then he talks a little bit about a reverend preaching that morning, blah, 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 and then he goes on to say, went round to see Voss last night, who is none too well. It was such a sad sight to find him sitting there moodily in front of the window, hollow-eyed with his feet on a stove. He is afflicted with cold feet. Key, too, is so pale and looks so tired. Key, of course, is this woman that he will later fall head over heels in love with. So this is another rare um, nod to her. He, he sees her. He says she looks pale and tired. He says, I went on from them to Uncle Cor's. He is, oh, by the way, when he says um, Voss has, he looks hollow eyed and he's got his feet on a stove, he's afflicted with cold feet. Well, Voss will later die. Um, within about three years of this point, Voss, Voss will no longer be alive. Actually, is it three years or is it, I think it's three years. And um, Key will become a, a widow with a little eight year old boy six, seven, eight-year-old boy. Uh, he goes on to say, he has had the salon repapered and a new grey carpet laid on the floor. Now those beautiful bookcases with the complete gazettes des beaux arts in their red binding stand out better than before. Uncle told me that Dubigny had died. I freely confess that I was downcast when I heard the news, just as I was when I heard that Brion had died. Um, Dubigny, just to remind you, Dubigny is from Auvers Souvoise. Dubigny's garden was something that Van Gogh would later paint. So this has an echo later on in the timeline of his story. He says, um, because of the work of such men, if it is understood, it touches us more deeply than one realizes. It must be good to die in the knowledge that one has done some truthful work and to know that, as a result, one will live on in the memory of at least a few and leave a good example for those who come after. That is just such an incredible statement from him. And I think, you know, if, if someone could just have patted him on the shoulder right there and said, um, that's you, you know, that's you, my boy. He says again, um, it must be good to die in the knowledge that one has done some truthful work and to know that as a result, one will live on in the memory of at least a few and leave a good example for those who come after. I think that is certainly true of him. He has left a good example in certain ways. Um, he's left an indelible um, print on people's um, hearts and minds in terms of um, his truthful work. And his life has touched a lot of people really deeply. Um, I experienced that when I went to Al and when I went to Orvez um, um, and obviously in the Netherlands as well, just the crowds and crowds of people that could have chosen to do anything with their day and that decided we're going to the Van Gogh Museum and, and you queue to get in there. You queue to get in there. The museum is chock full of people from top to tow, um, and people are just absolutely um, crazy about him. Um, you go to this little village, and it's got Van Gogh everywhere. Um, it's, it's, it, you know, he definitely did um, leave some truthful work behind. At the same time, I feel like people haven't done justice to his story. The truth of his life is still actually a bit of a mystery. So that is what he wants, is, is he wants to die in the knowledge that one has done some truthful work 
and that will live on in the memory. Well, you want the truth of your life to live on, not the myth. I, I think that's what he would feel. Um, thanks, Nisi. Nisi says, you touch us with Van Gogh. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot for that. Thank you. Uh, actually says his artwork is sacred. So he says, a work that is good may not last forever, but the thought expressed by it will, and the work itself will merely survive for a very long time. And those who come later can do no more than follow in the footsteps of such predecessors and copy the example. So in these words, you're really getting a sense that, dude, you are destined for greatness, right? And at this point, he's not even an artist. And he's talking about um, the, the, the work of someone's life as something that's truthful. That's really what he's talking about. He's saying, can you leave behind something that is truthful? And it's in reference to art. It's not in reference to kind of pastors. It's in reference to, for example, Dubini, who, who is an artist. It's, he's also saying this really profound stuff having just come from seeing Kivos and um, and I, I'm not and her husband as well. Then he says, speaking of good works, would you like to have a Flemish imitation of Christ? I hope to send it to you shortly in a small book, which, if need be, can easily be slipped into the pocket. When Uncle told me about Dubini, I thought of his etchings after Reisdal, and Uncle has promised to get hold of them as he did not know them at all. And then he talks about going to a reverend and he meets his wife and daughter and they spoke until 11 o'clock. I presume that's with the reverend, not with the daughter. Um, he says, he told me among other things that at certain times in his life, it did him good to forget himself completely and to throw himself into his work without reservation that he then achieved a great deal and later felt strengthened and further along the road on which he set out and enlightened in spirit. For all that, no one knows even how much effort his sermons cost him. That really rings a bell with what Dr. Gachet would say to him in the summer of 1890. Listen to this again. He says, at certain times in his life, it did him good to forget himself completely and to throw himself into his work without reservation. I do think that that is, that is um, something to try. That is something to, um, to experience. Um, I've certainly experienced that in terms of writing books and, and true crime, where I've forgotten myself completely and I've just written 100 books in about seven years. Um, when you do throw yourself without reservation, you forget yourself completely, you can achieve a lot. Easier said than done, though. Um, he said later he felt strengthened and further along the road on which he had set out. He goes on to say, I've worked on my way through the history of the Netherlands and have done an abstract of 30 closely written pages. I was pleased to come across the Battle of Waterloo and the 10-day campaign in it once again. Do you know that Rocheson once painted the siege of Leiden, I mean, the picture owned by Mr. DeFoss. I am now also working on general history. I'm looking forward more than a little to your coming here again. Do try your best to stay as long as possible. If you can, write again soon, for you know how much pleasure your letters always give me. Then he says he wrote to Harry Gladwell this week as he had not replied to my last letter. And so I wanted to know what he was doing and what he was planning to do. Vincent says, I'm still hoping he will become a clergyman, and if he does, he will do a good job of that, I'm certain. But it won't be an easy thing for him to achieve. So Van Gogh used to be a colleague of Gladwell, and they both worked at Goupil. Gladwell then kind of took over his job, and now Van Gogh's kind of saying, I hope he also becomes a clergyman. I hope he does what I'm doing. Kind of interesting. Uh, then he says, did you ever see an original etching by Millet of a man wheeling a barrow full of manure into a garden on a day like today in early spring? And remember as well that he made an etching, Les Bichiers, 
if you ever do come across it, you are unlikely to forget it in a hurry. I was thinking of the first this morning when Uncle Stricker was looking for texts in which the word manure or dung appears. <sighs> Let it alone this year also till I shall dig about it and dung, dung it. I just want to see if I can find that um, painting from Millet. Uh, see if I can find it. It could be this one. It could be this one. Hmm. Well, it's not now appearing there. It could be this particular image. Can you guys see that? Uh, Ivan says he fluctuates between being a teacher and being a student, which is fine in my opinion. Uh, we are found by self-forgetting, St. Francis Prey. Okay, so... Then he says, last Sunday, went to see cousin Freydach at the timber yards. There are still seven children at home, a pleasant little bunch, most of them very young. Could you perhaps give me notice somewhat in advance of your arrival? Blah, 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 handshakes. Um, yeah. So we go from 3 March to 3rd of April, so a full month goes by. It's a letter from Vincent van Gogh to Theo um, in Amsterdam. Van Gogh's in Amsterdam. We ba we're basically about a month away, maybe six weeks away from his exit from Amsterdam. Um, interestingly, in this letter, he doesn't even say, Dear Theo, he just kind of gets going. He says, I've been thinking about what we were discussing and the same sprang to mind. Um, we, are, we are today what we were yesterday. He's kind of saying... Who we were is who we are. He says, that does not mean that one must stand still and may not try to improve oneself. On the contrary, it is a compelling reason for doing so and for being glad to do so. But to be true to the saying, one must not backslide. And one has started to look at things freely and openly. One must not face about or stray. Those who said, we are the same today as we were yesterday, were honest men, as, it, as is apparent from the constitution they drew up, which will remain for all time, and of which it has been it has been well said that it was written with a ray of light from on high and a fiery finger. It seems like he's studied something and he wants to kind of reproduce it or represent it or relate it like immediately. He's so excited about this, he wants to kind of um almost like break it down into words and capture it in sentiments that he's sending to his brother. He says, it is a good thing to be an honest man and to try increasingly to be one partially and wholly. And one does not, one does well to understand that this entails being an inward and spiritual man. He who is firmly convinced he is one of their band will always go about his business quietly and calmly, never doubting that all must end well. So there's no doubt that the sentiments he's communicating are profound, are good, are true, but you've also got to come back to him ending up living with his parents. It does not do to dwell on dreams and forget to live. It's great to know these sentiments, but at some point you must internalize them, stand up and step out the door. You can't keep picking up sentiments, right? Otherwise, you'll just end up becoming sentimental. At some point, you've got to stop the introspection, the inward journey, and go on the outward journey, the author, which is the authentic journey as well. 
Um, I'm just saying with the journey is that you actually take action, not by reading someone else's words, it feels like you're taking action. In other words, where the inward journey is imprinted on you via your experiences in the world, whatever that is. Um, he goes on to say, Oh, if only I could be rid of this doubt and know for certain I shall come out victorious and succeed in the end. And then a voice answered him, and if you were certain, what would you do then? Act now as if you were certain and you will not be disappointed. Then the man went on his way, not unbelieving but believing, and returned to his work no longer doubting or wavering. I don't know really what to say about that. On the one hand, it sounds very um, commendable and good. But as I say, you know, where it says here, if you rid yourself of doubt, you'll know for certain you'll come out victorious and succeed in the end. Well, he doesn't. He doesn't succeed in the end. Um, in terms of this particular enterprise that is on now, it is a really good recipe for um, if you are struggling with, I guess, your confidence if you have this thing to go through, maybe it's your studies or something. But also sometimes when there's a voice saying to you, I can't do this, it doesn't mean you've got to override it. It doesn't mean you've got to ignore it. It doesn't mean you've got to dismiss it. And it, maybe you don't like this, but if you apply this to Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, if Amber's in a marriage to Johnny Depp, regardless of whether you like her or you don't like her, just within the ordinary circumstances of that. You've got doubts about this relationship. You've got doubts about what's going on. Should you just push that aside? Should you just dismiss it? Should you um, act now as if you were certain and you will not be disappointed? Well, in a situation like that, you can end up very disappointed. So there's a certain application to that where um, you're kind of thinking, well, this is all going to work out well in the end, but you've also got to ask, well, what if it doesn't? Um, if something doesn't work out, out well in the end, then the sooner you turn around on that, that road. So if you're going on a, let's think about it like, if you're going on a road with a, a vehicle that's gonna, that is like fated to break down, you're going on a road in a vehicle that will not, um, not break down, right? Then the sooner you turn around on the road that you're on, the quicker you're going to rescue yourself from impending um, mechanical failure. Does that make sense? So you kind of say, well, a, a warning light's come on on the dashboard. Uh, maybe there's not enough oil in the car. Um, I'm going to get rid of the doubt, and I'm, I'm going to know for certain that I'm going to get where I'm going. Oh, hang on, another warning light's come on. I, I'm going to be absolutely certain that no matter what, I'm going to get where I'm going. You've got to be, it's the difference between dogmatic and pig-headed and um, looking at your, your environment and responding to it, um, if that makes sense, right? So um, that's kind of the, the, the crux is... Um, can you focus on what you need to focus on without actually losing complete touch of reality around you? So you need to focus, true, but you can't forget about everything around you. In the same way you can't focus on everything around you, you need to remain focused. And that brings up that, that really famous sort of parable, that very famous story of what's the secret to life? And the secret to life is this little boy goes to... Um, the king and the king sitting on his throne and this little boy looks up at him and, and he says your majesty can you please tell me what is the secret to life and the king bends over and he and he brings someone over and he says give this boy a, a teaspoon and calls someone else over and, and he says we're going to pour some really precious oil into this teaspoon and he does that and the boy is holding this teaspoon with this oil in it. And he says, walk through this palace, walk through my my castle. And um, 
but don't drop any of that oil. Don't, you know, don't allow any of that oil to drop out of that teaspoon and then come back to me. And so that's what the little boy does. He walks off and after some time he comes back and the king says to him, um, did you did you see anything? You know, well, what did you see when, when you walked through my castle? The little boy says, I didn't really see anything. I was concentrating so much on not spilling any of this precious oil. And the king says, well, that's the secret to life. The secret is you need to go through the castle, see what is around you, and also not spill any of this precious oil. In other words, you've got to have this, whatever it is, this balance between paying attention to what's around you and also what's right in front of you. <laughs> you should drink it. Yeah. So in other words, it's that ability to um, do two things at the same time. You're aware of your environment, but you're also aware of where you're going. And you can't lose touch of either. You can't be like totally fixated on where you're going because then you will actually lose your way in terms of your environment. You can't be so caught up in your environment, what's peripherally around you, you're going to lose the, um, you're going to go off the road that you're on, right? So it's this, this uh, a certain amount of the one and a certain amount of the other that only you can decide what's the right amount. Do I need to pay more attention to the path in front of me or do I need to pay more attention to what is around me? And I would say, I don't know what, let me first put it, put the ball into your court. What do you think the answer is here? based on looking into the future of Van Gogh's life, specifically that he ends up living with his parents for uh, more than two years, the longest time that he spends in one place. What do you think, and it's something he would have liked to avoid it. You might think right now, it's not a big deal. He ended up staying with his parents. It probably is a big deal. As uh, I think he was in his 30s. As a, someone in your 30s, you, you'd rather not be there. You'd rather be out in the world doing, succeeding, um, you know, uh, what's that saying, um, taking names, kicking ass, taking names, whatever. Um, he'd rather not be in the state of disgrace for two, two very long years of his life. At, when he lived in Union with his parents, they sort of had him live, I think, in a sort of an outbuilding. Uh, but anyway, he said, they treat me like a shaggy dog that you, ro you rather don't actually want to have around. He actually says that. So let me ask you guys, um, what do you think, just in terms of that, I'm, I'm, I don't want us to like keep pronouncing judgment on the poor guy. And, um, you know, but in terms of to avoid that outcome, what did he need to do Pay more attention to the path right in front of him or pay attention to what's here, his environment, what other people are doing, the other people that is in his orbit. What should he have been doing? And I think the way to answer that is you've got to say, well, what was he doing? What was he paying attention to? So let's see what you guys say. Um, Nisi says both. Actually says, and it's a mystery, Nick, all a great mystery. Robbie Robin says, when my um, alternator light came on, I hoped I could still reach home, but I did not. My battery failed pretty quickly. Not there yet, says both. Yvonne says, uh, I think he needed to look a little more to the big picture. Uh, not there, it says, can you avoid either one? Yvonne, I'm, I'm kind of with you on that. I, I think that what he needed to do was, um, he was like in this very narrow sort of focus. He's, he's, he's looking at art, he's looking at poems, he's reading books, he's, but he's in a very sort of almost like a tunnel vision. Um, his life is in books and in the Bible and in churches. It's, it's all like the same thing, the same sort of narrow thing. 
And what he really needed to do was look that way. Um, just And in a way he was. He was looking at the sunset and trees and things like that, and that ended up being his saving grace, nature, the landscape, and so on. In going out into actually the world was where he found kind of home in the end, in these landscapes, walking into them, painting them, and all that kind of thing. But what I mean is um, his focus was very much on the path in front of him. Like, I must keep studying, I must keep reading what I'm reading. And, and he's not really aware of the world around him. Part of the world is everything that's the part of the world. The women that are around him, the young men that are around him that could be friends, um, um, uh, you know, I don't know, whatever it is that is beyond this narrow focus. And um, so, I, you know, he, whatever he did that got him to where he was when he got home with his tail between his legs, that certainly changed once he was there. Then he started to see, then he started to find himself in this great void. So in other words, if you're in this really narrow um, paradigm, right, where you living in a very, let me spell it out, A-N-A-L way. It's just like very, everything's the same and you, you only read the same stuff and you only focus on the same stuff. Um, you could find yourself shipwrecked in your life kind of, you know, washing or what you, like you, you almost like wash up on the shore like, um, like Tom Hanks in Castaway. And then suddenly your life having gone from this narrow focus, in Tom Hanks' case, it was, you know, he's a FedEx executive. Suddenly it's like so wide with so many possibilities that is overwhelming. That is like devastating. It's like the world is so big and so timeless and so um, um, without boundaries. Think about when you're on this island, um, the sea stretches on forever. Um, the island, you can sort of go around the island and, and then it's sort of like, what do you do with all of this, with all of this opportunity, all of this time, all of this limitlessness? But it's so much more difficult to navigate when you come from this very, very narrow focus. So you come from this very, very narrow focus and you thrown into this massive canvas where, you know, it's just you and just space all around you. And then weirdly enough, he goes from that back to a relatively narrow existence and he doesn't know how to cope with that. He goes from, he's rescued from um, the situation he was in where he's on this raft that he's built, but he's surrounded by a sea and obviously utterly devastated. He even loses Wilson, right? And then the next thing, he goes back into the world and now he can't sleep on a bed um, he finds people and their conversations and like at one point he, there's a buffet and there's just food everywhere and he just finds it so shallow, right? And so what Castaway kind of teaches you is to see where you belong in the world. Do you belong in the narrow thing or do you belong in the wide thing? And so you must make it narrower or wider. I hope that analogy sort of makes sense. What he sort of learned from that was was it was like um, I think it was that he wished he'd married that woman that he loved, um, and now he's got to sort of go beyond that. He's got to sort of find his way, right? And it ends off at a kind of a crossroads. Um, actually, says to get a horse out of a burning barn, you blindfold him. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, let's see if we can finish this letter. So it talks about, um, as for being a honest man and spiritual, one might not be able to develop into one through knowledge. So this is quite insightful. He says, in this journey to become this honest spiritual man, maybe you're not going to be able to develop into one through knowledge of history in general and of certain individuals from all ages in particular, from the history of the Bible to that of the revolution and from the Odyssey 
um, to the books of Dickens and Michelet. He says, and could we not learn something from the works of such men as Rembrandt? But he's kind of on the right track to say, um, to become this kind of person, you may not be able to do it just through the knowledge of, of books. That's kind of what he's saying. He says, it is by continually holding fast to these thoughts and deeds that we are filled with a good leaven at the, at the last, that of being sorrowful yet always rejoicing, which will become apparent when our lives have come to fruition, bearing the fruits of good works. Um, he says, we have talked a good deal about our duty and how we may attain the right goal. And we have properly concluded that our first objective must be to find a specific position and a profession to which we can wholly devote ourselves. And I believe that we also agree on this point, meaning that one must pay particular attention to the end and that a victory gained after a whole life of work and effort is better than one gained with greater dispatch. So he's trying to think with the end in mind. Is trying to live effectively. Um, anyone who lives an upright life and experiences real difficulty and disappointment and yet is not crushed by them is worth more than one for whom everything has always been plain sailing and who has known nothing but relative prosperity. So here again, I want to sort of remind you that there's this idea that Van Gogh struggled with misery, struggled and committed suicide. Here he's telling you that he welcomes difficulty, that disappointment is part of life and you shouldn't be crushed by it. And I don't think he was. Karina says, I'm at hospital. Are you okay, Karina? Karina, are you doing okay? <clears throat> well, are you comfortable? Are you okay? Do you, is there someone with you? Ricardo says, wondering why Vincent wasn't very interested in birds. Um, choose the grounding themes like flowers, trees, and land animals. Karina says, I will be okay. Okay, well... Um, you must let us know how you're doing and our thoughts are with you and um, our prayers are with you and um, obviously let us know how you, you know, just like let us know how you're doing and uh, hopefully how long are you going to be in the hospital? Okay, I'll tell you later, go on, okay. Anyway, I hope this is some comfort to you, um, you know, uh, Karina, but anyway, our thoughts are with you. Okay. Um, so I was saying, anyone who lives an upright life and experiences real difficulty and disappointment and yet is not crushed by them is worth more than one uh, for whom everything has always been plain sailing and who has known nothing but relative prosperity. And you must remember this psychology is absolutely operative to his next step, which is to go to the coal mines and, and be as dirty and um, sort of downtrodden as he possibly can be. That, that's kind of his fantasy. He wants to be one of these sort of ant-like figures under the mega machine um, um, uh, you know, that is, that, uh, that is sort of you know, this, this minute existence. He wants to kind of almost make himself insignificant and in that insignificance join in the fabric of um, the poor and the downtrodden and thereby gain a kind of um, a kind of significance as a um, beacon of light, I guess, as some kind of teacher to these um, souls that would otherwise be lost, I guess. Does that make sense? That's kind of the vision that he has. Um, but he wants it. He wants that vision. So then he says, for who are the most obviously superior to us? Those who merit the words, 
Laborers, your life is sad. Laborers, your life is full of suffering. Laborers, you are blessed. So you can see he's gotten this, um, I don't know if you want to call it Kool-Aid. He's, he's drinking this Kool-Aid and he's about to jump into the reality of, of this whole thing, right? He's, he's like gotten this idea, people who toil and labor, that's where um, life is happening, People, where people are sweating and struggling and, um, um, you know, the, the, the fight for survive, the toil is absolutely um, like this daily grind. He wants to go there. He kind of wants to go to the ground zero of suffering. And it's like, I want to go to a coal mine um, and um, tell people that things aren't so bad. Cool, that's what I'm going to do. Uh, and he wants to kind of say, laborers, your, your life is sad. Laborers, your life is full of suffering. Laborers, you're blessed. <laughs> and then he says, it is they who bear the marks of a whole life of struggle and labor born unflinchingly. He says, it is right to try to become like that. So we go in our way. Um, and he says, by the grace of God, unwearied. I don't know this for a fact, but something tells me, Vincent's been reading a lot of Emile Zola. I, I don't know that for a fact, but I think this is Zola that's coming through. Anyway, he says, as for me, I must become a good preacher who has something to say that is right and is of use in the world, and perhaps it is as well that I should spend a relatively long time on preparation, be securely confirmed in an unwavering faith before I am called to speak to others about it. There's to me a little bit of the intensity of him saying, I'm not, you know, to keep us, he says to her, it doesn't matter what your feelings are to me. I, no matter what, am going to love you forever. So it's really just a matter of time before your ice melts. The fact is I love you and it's just one of those things. It's the same kind of um, very determined attitude but it's based on absolutely no experience of what he's talking about. So he's saying, you know what, I can be totally unwavering, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, you can be. But anyway, maybe go into that situation and see what happens. And obviously we see what happens. Anyway, he goes on to say, um, I mean, all credit to him that he puts his money where his mouth is, that he has these feelings, he gets his inspirations and he acts on them. But then what does happen? What does happen with that? So he says he wants to become a preacher and he says um, he's getting the sense of unwavering faith, which will he will then lose when his relationship with Kivos doesn't work out. But he talks about this unwavering faith before I'm called to speak to others about it. He then says, it is fitting that before one embarks upon that work, a treasure should be gathered up that others can enjoy. Let us but go forth quietly, testing everything and holding fast to what is good and trying all the time to learn more of what is useful and adds to our, our, our experience. Then he uses a Dutch word. He says, Viermut, which means melancholy. Um, maybe a good experience is nice saying. Theo, melancholy may actually be a good experience, provided we write it as two words, via, which means woe, which is in every man. He says woe is in every person, each of us having reason enough, but it must be allied to mut, which means courage. So he's saying via mut, which is together the word means melancholy, but when you separate it, it is, becomes woe and courage. And so you must... Go, go and like look for woe and then meet that with courage, right? Again, this shows you the kind of dude he wants to be and that this whole idea that is the suicidal troubled guy means, you know, it's like that you, you've totally misinterpreted Vincent van Gogh. He likes trouble. He likes suffering. He likes misery, but he's also quite a courageous guy. You just don't understand him really, you know, that's the situation. Anyway, it's quite interesting. He says, woe, which is in every man, each of us having reason enough, but it must be allied to courage, and the more the better, 
for it is good to be someone who never despairs, and that's who he tries to be. Um, if only we try to live righteously, we shall fare well, even though we are bound to encounter genuine sadness and real disappointments and shall probably commit real mistakes and do things that are wrong. But it is certainly better to be ardent in spirit, even though one makes one makes one makes more mistakes than to be narrow minded and overcautious. I feel like he's so close to being on the right track. Um He's right about it's okay to make mistakes and to to experience sadness and have real disappointments. He's so close to being on the right track. He's just not applying it because it's like, okay, so apply that in terms of your love life. So you make a mistake, somebody doesn't like you or they reject you, okay. That's a real mistake. That's a real disappointment. Well, try it now with somebody else, Right. I'm just saying apply that in terms of Vincent van Gogh and, and he can't seem to apply that. He's devastated when he's rejected. So it's all fair and well to have this um, highfalutin, um, these, these ideas, and they sound great on paper, but, but try and actually live them out. And the, the amazing thing is that ultimately he sort of does. I'm, 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 I'm being a little bit harsh, but in the fullness of time, um, that this is a good explanation for Van Gogh's life beyond the next couple of years. He does try to live righteously. Um, he, he, um, I'm not sure if he does fare that well, but he does encounter genuine sadness. He does encounter real disappointments. He does commit real mistakes. Things do go wrong. And he says, despite all of that, it's better to be ardent in spirit than just to be narrow-minded. And over cautious. So it does end up going on the adventure of the artist, and that at least is something. The last two years of his life definitely was some kind of adventure, that's for sure. Um, he says, it is good to love as many things as one can, and therein lies true strength. And those who love much, do much, and accomplish much, and whatever is done with love is done well. If one is affected by some book or other, let us say by Michelet's blah, 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 he mentions a couple of books, to mention just a few, then it is because that book is written from the heart in simplicity and meekness of spirit. Better to say but a few words but filled with meaning than to say many that are but idle sounds and as easy to utter as they are useless. So I kind of think what is, and this is a really, is a lot of emotion in this letter, I think is what he's kind of saying here is also gives us an idea of if you had to encounter Van Gogh, what would he be like? But I think the answer is he would probably not say very much. He he, he's, he is someone who's so serious about his subject matter that he's not inclined to make small talk, and that's exactly what Marguerite Gachet um sorry, not Marguerite Gachet, Adeline Revue said when he painted her portrait, they didn't really say anything. He didn't tolerate really small talk. And he says, yeah, it's better to say a few words but filled with meaning than to say many but that are idle sounds. I think that's one side of him that Van Gogh is a sort of a dude who doesn't say much, but I think there's another side to him that won't shut up that can talk someone's ear off, it can kind of like chew someone's ear off, he's got so much to say, because he's so lonely, and that's what he ends up doing, for example, to Gogar, right? Gogar arrives there, and two months later, he's, he's like, it's almost like he's running out of the, the yellow house, his hair on fire, screaming like, get me out of here, get me, just, I, I've got to be, I've got to be away from this guy, otherwise I'm going to go nuts. Anyway, <laughs> He goes on to say, love is the best and the noblest thing in the human heart, especially when it is tested by life as gold is tested by fire. Happy is he who has loved, loved much and is sure of himself. And although, so look at that. Happy is he who has loved much. Vincent, have you loved much? Have you loved uh, more than one girl? Um, and he's sure of himself. And although he may have wavered and doubted, he has kept that divine, that divine spark alive and return to what was in the beginning and ever shall be. Now, I must say, 
when you think about that in terms of Van Gogh as the artist, isn't that a beautiful expression? You can see this guy is destined to become incredible. Um, he's got the theory, now he needs to start drawing, and he will. Uh, he talks about, although he may have wavered and doubted, and Van Gogh definitely wavered and doubted, he said, he has kept that divine spark alive and return to what was in the beginning and ever shall be. If one only keeps loving faithfully what is truly worth loving and does not squander one's love on trivial and insignificant and meaningless things, one will gradually obtain more light and grow stronger. Those are definitely words to consider in the context that he ends up never selling his art, but then also in the context that ultimately his art becomes the most some of the most valuable art in the world. He says, the sooner one tries to become accomplished in a certain position in life and a certain field and adopts a relatively independent way of thinking and acting, and the more one keeps to set rules, the stronger in character one will grow. And that does not mean becoming narrow-minded. I'm not sure if I agree with that. Um, I don't know whether if you keep to, to the rules, especially within the prescripts of what he's sort of talking about, I don't know whether you develop character in terms of um, authentic character. I think it's you've built a house of cards and another house of cards. Um, I, I think it does actually make you quite narrow-minded. That's just my personal view. Um and Van Gogh um, himself, in terms of his art, breaks the rules. He goes beyond Impressionism. Bear in mind he's, uh, I think, 24 years old when he writes this letter. Sorry, 25 years old. He's 25 years old when he writes this letter. And he will later find out that he is going to break certain rules. Um, and so, you know, as a 25-year-old, he's, he's somewhat naive in terms of that. But it's because he breaks rules in art that he basically becomes a he, he sets new boundaries. He sets new um, a new he sets something in motion that wasn't there before, which is expressionism. You must also think about that the fact that he's an expressionist, that he's effusive as a person, but he's also effusive. Um, in his letters, and that effusiveness translates to his art. That's the thing that he's got to try and figure out: is how do I, how do I demonstrate? How do I translate? How do I render? How do I um, express this effusiveness that I feel on a canvas? How do I do that? And the answer is not this. The answer to how do I show that effusiveness is not this. It's not these drab scenes. It's this sort of thing. So again, how do I show this effusiveness that I'm feeling? Well, like that. And like that, right? In a, in a very, very simple sense, the answer is color. How do I show the spectrum of emotion? How do I, I show this passion? How do I show this lust for life? Color. Um, to some extent, the style of painting, the rapid strokes, the thick, what do they call it, impasto, right? Um, it's a combination of things, but central to that, change your palette change the way that you you see the world, widen your horizons, get out of Dodge, get out of the Netherlands, go to another country, see beyond what you're seeing, and then see the, the full spectrum. And then, um, then there is a place for that effusiveness to be, um, to, to sort of land, almost like a seed in soil, right? Um, Actually says, color is light. 
Anyway, so this is quite a profound um, letter. He talks about um, something about someone being someone who prefers to be quietly alone with his work and seems to need very few friends, will go safest in the world and among people. He says, one should never feel secure just because one has no difficulties or cares or handicaps. One, once again, is embracing this idea of struggle, of misery, of hardship. He says, and one should never be too easygoing. Even in the politest circles and the best surroundings and circumstances, one should retain something of the original character of a Robinson Crusoe or of a primitive man. Now, unless I find that really incredible, is I spoke to you guys a moment ago about Castaway, and I haven't, I didn't read this letter in preparation. This particular letter, I didn't read this in preparation for this live stream, and I've actually, I've, I've tapped into the consciousness exactly of what he's talking about. Is this idea of. Um, breaking away from everything and being on like a deserted island, breaking away from the narrowness of life and ending up on this vast canvas. What do you do with that? What do you do with the narrowness? What do you do with the vastness? And here he's actually talking about um, the contemporary castaway character, which is Robinson Crusoe, the same kind of thing, a dude that ends up on this deserted island. You know, the whole... Um, um, uh, is it Robert Louis Stevenson's story? Um, it talks about one should retain something of the original character of a Robinson Crusoe or of a primitive man. Um, well, it actually says this is the best talk yet, inspired. Thanks. Cool. Um, I'm not going to be for too much longer, probably another 15 minutes. Um, Hey, Jealousy says, being a hermit is acceptable today. Um, anyway, so he says, listen to this. He says, um, for otherwise one cannot be rooted in oneself and one must never let the fire in one's soul die. For the time will inevitably come when it will be needed, when that fire in one's soul will be needed. And he who chooses poverty for himself and loves it possesses a great treasure and will hear the voice of his conscience address him ever more clearly. So again, here he's saying, the guy who chooses poverty for himself and loves it, not just chooses it, but loves it, possesses a great treasure and then he'll hear his conscience speaking to him. And again, you say, is this guy a suicidal guy? Because didn't he choose poverty for himself? Why did Vincent van Gogh commit suicide? Well, he never sold a painting. Did he really want to? Did he really want to be rich or successful? Did he really care for the conventional measures of success that society says is successful? Yeah, he's saying, I don't care about any of that stuff. He's almost saying, I want to be poor. I want to struggle. Um, if I'm poor, I will possess the treasure that I want. Right? That's literally what he's saying here. He says, he who hears that voice, which is God's greatest gift in his innermost being and follows it, finds in it a friend at last and is never alone. And then he talks quite a bit about God here. I don't know if I want to really go through it all, but he says, um, one can learn this from the Bible as well, as well as from all other things. It is good to go on believing that everything is more miraculous than one can ever begin to understand. For that is the truth. It is good to remain sensitive and humble and tender-hearted, even though one may have to hide one's feelings, as is often necessary. One wonders what he actually means by that, by saying you've often got to hide your feelings. One wonders, like, what may, thanks a lot for that little message, authentic journey. One wonders what he means by... Um, what feelings are, is he hiding? He says, it is good to be well-versed in the things that are hidden from the wise and the learned of this world, but that are revealed as if by nature to the poor and simple, to women and little children. For what can one learn which is better than that which God has given by nature to every human soul and which goes on living and loving, hoping and believing in the depths of every soul unless we wantonly destroy it. 
The need is for nothing less than the infinite and the miraculous, and a man does well to be satisfied with nothing less, and not to feel easy until he has gained it. That is what all great men have acknowledged in their works, all those who have thought a little more deeply and searched and worked and loved a little more than the rest, who have plumbed the depths of the sea of life. Plumb the depths, that is what we too must do if we want to make a catch. And if we sometimes have to work the whole night through without catching anything, then we do well not to give up and to cast the net out once more at dawn. So let us move forward quietly, each on his own path, forever making for the light. Lift up your hearts and in the knowledge that we are as others are, and that others are as we are, and that it is right to love one another in the best possible way, believing all things, hoping for all things, and enduring all things, and never failing, and not being too troubled by our weaknesses, for even he who has none has one weakness, namely that he has none, and anyone who believes himself to be consummately wise would do well to be foolish all over again. It's quite a nice sentiment there. Let me read that again. Uh, anyone who believes himself to be consummately wise would do well to be foolish all over again. That is something that seems to be the story of Van Gogh's life. He achieves a certain amount of wisdom and then starts again. He says, men must be tested in the fire of life to become fortified inwardly. Um, and by the grace of God, they are by nature. So, what I've been talking about, that he needs to not have this theoretical knowledge of life. He needs to go out and live. It seems like that penny has dropped as well. It seems like he's like, cheapest, I need to get out of here. And so that's why he goes to the Bori Nage. He's kind of realized, I don't want to be a theoretical pastor. I want to go and go to where the struggle is the worst. I want to go and deal with the laborers, right? Yeah, a f the fool for God. Um, he says, so it may be with us, my boy, and may you fare well along your path, and may God be with you in all things and help you to succeed, which with a warm handshake on your departure is the wish of your very loving brother, Vincent. And so actually what had happened now was Theo had apparently temporarily transferred uh, from where he was, I think in The Hague, to Goupil House in Paris. So at this point, um, this is April 1878, uh, Theo transfers to um, Paris, and that is where Vincent would eventually meet up with Theo again quite a few years later. I just want to see exactly where that is. Um, he meets up with Theo eight years later. So at this point, Theo goes to Paris, and Vincent will go on a very long roundabout route doing what he's doing, and he will ultimately join Theo. Theo's gone to Paris now. He will ultimately join Theo in Paris in eight years later. Um, I think it does, does it say that he temporarily went to Paris? Theo had temporarily transferred to the Goupil house in Paris. So I'm not actually sure when Theo was finally transferred there. But anyway, at this point, Theo does go to Paris. And eight years from this point, um, Vincent will go and actually stay with his brother in Paris as well. He also talks about, it is only a very small light, the one in a little Sunday school room in Brandestier, but let me keep it burning. Even if I should not, however, I do not think that Adler is the man to let it go out. Okay. I kind of get the feeling that Van Gogh is reading these incredibly profound texts and he's getting so, um, the zeal is really bubbling up, the fire is really burning, and he feels like, I'm making history here, and as it turns out, he is. His words are going to, you know, I mean, his words are echoing right now across um, 154 years of, of, of history, of time. 
Uh, and I think this is the final letter from um, from Vincent van Gogh to Theo and from Amsterdam before the next phase of his life. So this is the very last letter. And I think that's going to be the last letter for this episode. Uh, the next letter is a letter from Vincent's parents to Theo from Zundert. Um, and then and then Vincent writes to Theo quite a few months later in July. So nothing in June, but near the end of the July he writes about um, Belgium and everything that has changed. And I think he also does a sketch here of... Yeah, you know, there's another sketch accompanying this letter. We will get to that in um, Van Gogh Letters 11. I also want to sort of refer to what's in here a little bit more. Um, but to be to be honest, the letters in the beginning, they don't deal with that that much. They deal with the 1880s a bit more, and we're not quite there yet. Um, I really do want to show you the art that he does when certain letters are written, but we're not quite there yet. He hasn't actually started uh, painting. So let's do the final letter. Um, letter from Vincent to Theo, Amsterdam, May 1878. The final letter from Amsterdam before this next phase of his life. Ready. Ready for it. Dear Theo, it is time for you to hear from me again. I've already heard from Father of your safe arrival and how you walked all over the city during those first days. I'm very curious to hear what your first impressions were. So as soon as you find time to write, your letter will be welcomed. It is true, however, that first impressions often change, for we know only too well that all is not gold that glitters, or as we would say, all that glitters is not gold and that though there may be a bright dawn, there is also a dark midnight and a burning oppressive heat at noon. But just as the morning hour is blessed and is worth much gold, so first impressions keep their value, even though they pass, for sometimes they prove to have been right after all, and one comes back to them. So write me what you saw these first days and what your thoughts have been. Just now we are having bad weather here, and probably it is the same in Paris. You will soon perceive that it is much warmer there in summer than in Holland. And you will also, because bear in mind, Vincent spent some time himself in Paris working for Goupil. Uh, he goes on to say, you will soon perceive that it is much warmer there in Paris in summer than in Holland. And you will also see thundery skies like the ones Bonington painted. The quarter of town where you live is rather interesting. When one walks through the streets there or towards Montmartre in the morning or evening, one sees many a workshop and many a little room that reminds one of this and that or other pictures by Eduard Freire. At times it is good to see such simple things when one sees so many people who for different reasons have strayed from all that is natural and so have lost their real and inner life. And when one also sees so many who live in misery and horror, for in the evening and at night, one sees all kinds of black figures wandering about, men as well as women, in whom the terror of the night is personified and whose misery one might class among things that have no name in any language. Um, you sort of wonder, you, you must remember... Um, for us, living in a city is normal and natural, or the urban setting is not alien, not completely alien to us. Also for us, the transition from a kind of rural or suburban setting to a, the, the city life, the commuting, the corporate thing, is kind of something that we know and are familiar with. You can imagine 150 years ago that you could think that there's something evil about the structures that are being set up, 
the routines, the um, the way that people are being divided and scheduled and regimented and the way that people are almost kind of becoming zombified. People that were a certain way are now um, on, on, on sort of transports and sitting behind desks and um, in a sort of commercial setting that if you're a country boy or Trump, country bumpkin, it's quite um, kind of horrifying. You know, it's almost like um, it's a horror in a way of, you know, if you, you, you're a child on a school holiday and then your mother says, well, the school holidays end today and tomorrow you've got to go back to school. It's a sort of thing of lost freedom, um, the receding Arcadia, right? But this is just more on a civilizational level where you used to these rural settings, you used to farms and villages, and now suddenly there's this industrialization that's never been seen before. And there's something fearsome about it. There's something monstrous about it. There's something dark and devastating about it. It's like the human, um, the human species is being taken to the more of this great industrial greasy monster that's noisy and that is seems to be really destructive and seems to be taking us on this conveyor to a place we shouldn't be going. And Van Gogh's observing this and he's saying, oh, no. And he's saying, I'd rather go somewhere else. I'd rather go back into the country, and that's where he goes. I don't want to be in this big city that's sort of salivating. I don't want to see these people turning in, into monsters, right? Um, let me read that again. He says, at times it is good to see such simple things when one sees so many people who for different reasons have strayed from all that is natural and so have lost their real and inner life. And when one sees so many who live in misery and horror, for in the evening at night, one sees all kinds of black figures walking about, men as well as women, in whom the terror of the night is personified, and whose misery one must class among the things that have no name in any language. It's a really kind of deep statement. I don't know whether he's talking about trains that, these sort of hulking trains that sort of move across the tracks from one destination to the other. In our time, we've got trucks and things like that do that, but in their time, they've got to move um, things like, I don't know, produce, because cities have sprung up, produce, um, coal, uh, from one point to another to to get it go into the furnace of the city. And so um, all of this is quite frightening, these big machines and these this 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 sort of um, monolithic um, thing that is coming up and, and it's so impersonal and it's so monstrous, basically the rise of the mega machine. Anyway, he says, goes on to say, last week one of the clergymen that yet died, he was known all over the country, Pantacook, he was buried last Saturday. That procession on the path along the green borders of the Amstel reminded me of In Memoriam. He was the father of six children, the eldest about 20 years old. A large crowd followed and they literally jostled each other. A memorial service was held in almost all the churches yesterday. I heard Uncle Stricker, uh, who had known him very well. Uh, he preached in the Odyssey Chapel, which is, I think, the old chapel in the south, where the, the boys from the orphanage and those from the sailors' training school usually go. The, firm, the, the sermon was full of sentiment. Uncle's text was, I am greatly distressed, and what shall I say? He had undergone terrible and long suffering. One night I heard one of his last sermons, and it was clear from what he said that he shuddered and shrank from each new day and night especially from the one which followed the exertion of preaching. Even then, one could not hear him without feeling with him and shuddering involuntarily, for the road leading to the eternal home is dark, and happy is he who is strengthened by the hope of a better life when the darkness and night approaches. And he wants to go to, to that machine, that darkness, that um, uh, powdery coal face, he wants to go there and he wants to look at the sort of white eyes that are peeking through that and try and say something that's soothing to those people. So it's almost like 
the, this tremendous fear and fearsomeness. He feels like he's almost like this knight in shining armor going with his sword to the dragon. And he's about to do kind of do his duty. He's about to do what he's being trained to do. Anyway, he says, do not let all the distraction keep you from reading some good book, for instance, blah, 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 blah. And then he says, today I hope to take a long walk through the section of town where I have not been often. I finally found the house in Breastrad where Rembrandt lived. You know we spoke about it when you were here. Think of that particular picture in Luxembourg. He that receiveth, you receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. And tell me who painted it. Theo, Paris is so beautiful in autumn, you'll begin to notice it towards the end of September. Give my kind regards to all at Sooks. I so often remember an excursion I made with his family. Uh, entering the little church there, it struck me to find more than one picture by Corot. You know he was there often. Give also my compliments to Brad and Matters. I don't know who that is. Um, the last thing he says, I still have to thank you for your photograph. It is very good, and I'm glad to have it. Many thanks. I think Theo sent him, like, a, basically, it's not a selfie, but a photo of himself. Um, and so he says, thanks very much for it. So that is the very last letter from Amsterdam. It doesn't say anything directly about, I'm going to Belgium, but that is where he ends up next. So I'm not going to take it further than this. Um, the next letters are from Vincent's parents to Theo from Zundert. Um, I just want to see if they mention. So here's a letter from Reverend Van Gogh to Theo written in April 1878 talking about Vincent. I'm afraid he's very unhappy, but what can we do about it? We encourage him and give him the opportunity of continuing his studies, although we hardly know how to manage. So they're kind of saying, we don't really know what to do. Then, then they say, it is a sickly existence he has chosen, I'm afraid, and how much he will still have to endure and we together with him. So the family are like, this isn't looking good. It's really not looking good. And he's still got to go through so much and he's going to drag us into this as well. We would have been taken into this misery with him. Um, I, do, I don't know whether there's any mention here of... Um, oh, here it is, Belgium. Okay, so here it is. I just want to take you into Belgium uh, so that you get a sense of where this is going. It's just really the lot. This is the next letter, but it's also the very last letter um, before we, we deal with Vincent in July. It's a month after this letter. Uh, so Reverend Van Gogh to Theo, so Vincent's father to Theo, 7th June 1878, so about a month after that other letter we've just gone through. He says, we don't know yet where this crisis will lead to. So this is how Vincent's parents see what is happening here as a crisis. It's like what we hear in these letters, like, wow, that's really beautiful. That's really profound. That's amazing. Well, that's not the feeling that his parents have. They, they think this is a really a serious crisis. And um, he says, because I did not want to rush things. I told him that for the time being, he should go on with his lessons for three months, giving me time to think his, think things over. So Vincent was like, I, I need to get out there. Need, I've got to start being hands-on. I've, I've got to preach. I've got to jump into the trenches. I've got to start slaying monsters. And his father's like, no, no, hold on, slow down. Not yet. Wait, 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 wait. But he's like, no, I'm not waiting. I'm going. Um, so he says, in the meantime, I've written to the Reverend van der Brink, who is now a parson at um, Rousselare in Belgium, asking him whether he might be used in that country. The Reverend van der Brink thinks it is not impossible that a post as evangelist might become available for which knowledge of English and French would be an asset. So um, although the Reverend van Gogh's not chuffed with what's happening, he's trying to sort of find a position for his son. Um, in in Belgium, 
um, is trying to like, you know, um, pull some strings. So the Reverend Van der Brink says, I think it's impossible that a post will come about and I'll keep you informed and try to help. Then a little bit further down the letter, he says, perhaps we should risk this experiment as a last resort. So he's, he's obviously in two minds, like, should he be doing this? This really seems like um, folly. That's, that's how he sees it. But Vince's father nevertheless says, maybe you should do it. Maybe we should let Vincent do this. Yvonne says, my parents thought I was a serious crisis too. I think, I think the same can be said for me. Anyway, so he says, perhaps we should risk this experiment as a last resort, but everything is still so uncertain. It is a problem that worries us seriously, but let us not lose courage. You have always said, who knows whether he will not pull through someday and succeed. May God grant it. I don't know, that's just so um, kind of heartbreaking, isn't it? Where his father says to his brother that, you know, you've always said, who knows, maybe he will, maybe he will um, pull through someday and succeed. And isn't that the truest summary of Vincent van Gogh that, that, that has ever been spoken? That ultimately did pull through someday, many, many years later, and, and, and sort of succeeded in terms of his legacy, you know. So pretty incredible. So we're going to stop there. The, the next letter will be um, dealing with Vincent from, from Vincent to Theo from Etten, 22nd July. So it's going to be quite interesting to see how his life's already changed and what goes on from there. Um, thank you to everyone who's voted. Um, I see the asylum and all won won your votes, most of your votes. Um, but no, he didn't spend most of his time there. Um, did you guys find this quite an interesting episode? A um, little bit of a different tone. Did you guys find it quite interesting? Um, True Jedi Forever says, these letters are fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing them with us this way. They really come to life. Nisi says, thank you, Nick. Another beautiful Van Gogh Sunday. <clears throat> Thanks. I really appreciate that. Paddy says, we will try to do better on the next pop quiz, Nick. Okay. I'm going to have to try and think of one that's, that's going to perhaps outfox you, but you guys are getting cleverer by the day. So... Thanks, Yvonne. Yvonne says, bravo. A Jealousy says, no one is sleeping. Thank you, Nick. Thanks a lot for that. Um, I'm glad to see you still with us, Karina, and I'm glad that you also appreciated this. Glad that we can sort of reach you in some way, but all the best where you are. I don't know if you know the word starter. It's a Dutch word meaning be strong. So I don't know if, what the word is in... Austrian, but it might be one you recognize. Uh, Axie says, thank you, Brother Nick. Paddy says, you are the best. Thanks for that. Amazing job, Nick, and chat. Thanks very much to um, our mod, Nisi. Uh, really good to have you here. Thanks to all the members. And um, I will be stark, okay. <laughs> I hope so. I hope you're going to pull through. Margaret Zabinski, it's a pleasure. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, guys, for joining me here. Uh, Terry says, spiritually uplifting afternoon with you all. That's great to hear. So, wow, can you believe it? We're at episode 10, and uh, it's still only the middle of 1878, but we now are going to the Coal Forge. We are going out of... of I don't know, whatever context we were in, indoors, Amsterdam, the Netherlands, and we're now going out into the coal mines. So what's going to what's going to follow from here is, is definitely going to test Vincent. He's going to test this young man, and um, 
he's going to certainly go through certain trials and experiences that no one could expect, right? Timmy, um, not sure where he is. Timmy. Timmy, come. Come, boy. Timmy, come. Timmy. There he comes. Come, boy. It's quite cold here. It's quite cold here tonight. So I think he was quite warm and snuggly. So that's why I didn't really want to get up. But uh, I'm actually going to have to put some netting on my delicious monster now because tomorrow is supposed to be below freezing. Um, so frost tomorrow. So we're going to have to keep warm. Also, he really needs a shave um, and a bath, but uh, I'm going to hold that off because the next couple of days are going to be especially cold. I'm sure where you guys are, it's getting warmer, and I'm sure where you guys are, summer's on its way. Winter's definitely here. So, not there yet, says you'll be in my prayers for real to Karina. We'll all be thinking of you, Karina. Take care. <laughs> Timmy, come. Yeah. Well, there Timmy is. Timmy says goodbye. Right. Um, and I think he, he wants to head back to my bed. I must say lately, Timmy and Ivy have been just like lying next to each other. Like um, Ivy hasn't been like... Uh, wanting to get um, onto my bed because Timmy's there, but lately I think she's also like, okay, this is too cold. I need I need to snuggle. So, uh, wow, Terry says we've already had 103 degrees here. Okay. <laughs> Susan says Senior Holmes need to needs to make his appearance. Yeah. Uh, actually, says we're getting flowers and warmth. Yeah, we're definitely losing. I don't think there are going to be many leaves left after after this on the trees. Okay, guys, um, thanks for joining me. I think it was a good session, and I'll, I'll see you guys later. Um, wherever you are in the world, if it's Europe, have a good sleep. Karina, we hope you're comfortable and, and okay and going to be okay getting some good care. If you're in the States, um, have a good rest of your night. And quite a big week coming up next week with Johnny Depp verdict. So we'll see what happens there. Bundle up, I definitely will. We'll we'll be thinking of you, Karina. Karina says she'll be in hospital for a few days, but okay. So hopefully you're going to get good treatment. Um, you definitely will be in our thoughts. Let us know um, how things are going. <laughs> Actually, says the world is so amazing. Cool. And on that note, take care, guys. See you guys next time. Ciao.